Good morning. Everyone can sit down and we're going to get ready. And uh, today is a very short message because it's the end of the series. So this is level five in the five levels of how to get to uh, where God has called you to be to your purpose. And we're going to go over the last, uh, the last section. And you know what? I was reading over this thing last night. And uh, I found some connections between this and the, the series of angels that God wants us to do on Wednesdays. And uh, for those of you who weren't here on Wednesday, we spoke something amazing that most people have never heard before uh, about angels. First thing, and there was two main things. The first thing was there is a connection in the Bible you'll find, the duality between those who are, uh, I'm going to say, false prophets, bad pastors or bad teachers, and Christians who live beyond the means of grace. The Bible says to the point of lewdness. In other words, they just, grace, it, it, it's twisted. So you have, this, you have this duality three times in the Bible where God compares people who are doing wrong in the kingdom of God and good angels. And there's a reason for it. And, you know, if you, you weren't there, you can go and look at it again. That's the first part, first thing. Two examples in the New Testament, one example in the Old Testament, but this one is really quite amazing. Uh, most people don't know this, but there will be a, a huge increase of angelic activity in the last days. And the angelic activity, according to how the Bible implies it, is that they will come down physically and interview each and every person. They'll go look around and talk to people. And depending upon the answer that you give, they will give a report back to God about whether you should be raptured or not. And uh, you need to know what to say to them. So if you don't know what to say, you'll have to go watch that video again. I'm not teaching it a second time. <laughs> but that is in the Bible. Uh, there'll be great angelic activity. And the Bible says those same angels, or at least we assume it's the same angels. But the Bible says God sends his angels to go and fetch the people. So we know there'll be mass angelic activity with random, with people. They're not actually people, they're angels unawares that walk around the city and people will identify what an, uh, uh, and, and the, the angels will identify who and what your standing is with God based upon the questions that they ask you, right? It's incredible, incredible stuff, right? Um, and Goni was pr uh, talking today about, uh, uh, about being a good vessel for God. Does anyone remember from this teaching on, in Joshua, what does the Bible call someone or something that is being used as a vessel? There's a special name, God says. The Bible says, those are the ones with the name upon them. So the, the angel with the name of God upon him is a vessel. A man with the name of God upon him is a vessel to God. That means God can use him. He's a good vessel. God has entrusted him with his name. There's a difference between somebody who just has a word from God, who is a prophet. There is a difference between somebody who just has a, 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 a word from God or a scripture or a message from God, or if they are just anointed. The Bible makes it very clear. There's a difference between those who are just anointed and those who carry the glory of God and carry the name of God. And the anointing, a lot of the anointing is given at a very easy level. And if you are under somebody who has the anointing, you can actually just borrow it. And uh, you can use that. That happens to a lot of people. Uh, and that's one way. But to get the name, to get the glory of God, it must be earned. The Bible says even Jesus, in the book of Hebrews, and we're going to go through a little bit of that today. Jesus had to earn his name. Jesus had to earn his authority and earn the right to, 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 to have the name Yeshua, right? In fact, that's the wrong pronunciation as well, right? And if you guys know that, we uh, as you know, the Western society likes to anglicize all the names, right? So we, and before we continue, I'm going to tell you that secret now, right? There, most of the names in the Bible, especially the New Testament names, are all anglicized. They're not the real names, right? Does anyone know what Mary's real name is? All the Marys in the Bible, their real name. Miriam. All Marys are Miriam. Can anyone tell me what James's real name is? Jacob. Jacob, yeah. Abraham is Ibrahim. Well, that's the correct pronunciation of it. 
and uh, David is Davi, which is very easy. Um, there's a few others also in there, but the one that's most important that everyone should know is Jesus is an anglicized Greek or a Greek version of the Hebrew name Yeshua. And Yeshua is a mispronunciation. That's an anglicized version of the Jewish name Yeshua. So whenever pastors sing the song, they don't sing Yeshua, they sing Yeshua, right? Yeshua sounds like another name, Joshua. Jesus' real name is Joshua, Yeshua. Joshua means the salvation of God. This is very important because Joshua's life entirely mirrors Jesus' life, front to back. All the numbers, remember I said there's a hidden story in the back? How long was the king locked in a cave for? Three days. How long did it take them to cross the Jordan? Three days. The amount of time on the other side of the wilderness? 40 years. Jesus, 40 days. Comes across this side. What does he do? He proclaims the word of God. He redoes the covenants. Like Jesus, he came and proclaimed and said, I am here to proclaim, uh, uh, to bring sight to the blind, to set the captives free. He proclaimed at the right moment. The way he attacks the kings, the way Joshua attacks the kings each and every year is the same way Jesus attacks the demon spirits each and every time in the Bible. When Jesus came to preach, the first time he preached, he got kicked out of church, right? They tried to throw him over the, bri or throw over the cliff because he said, the word is being produced now. And then at first they were like, yeah, but he's a carpenter. But they weren't like angry with him. They were just like annoyed that for some reason, this carpenter is proclaiming to be the Messiah. And the people among themselves began to talk and say, can't really be him because he's supposed to come from Bethlehem. Can't really be him because he's supposed to come out of Egypt, right? Jesus did all three. And the, the last one was, he's from Nazareth, right? And then so they were like, how can this be possible? Because he grew up in our synagogue. And then he said, Jesus just makes them real angry. Jesus says, you will not accept me but, Jesus, but God the Father knew that, and even in the Old Testament, he didn't come to any Jew, he went to a, 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 a Samaritan woman when, G, when God sent Elijah. He went to a widow of Zarephath, she was not of, the, not of the tribe. In other words, she was not to inherit the promise, but Jesus said, God sent Elijah to the widow of Zarephath and ignored all the Jewish women. He ignored all the Jewish people that were suffering, didn't help them and help somebody else outside. Then he said, he gave another example, and he basically he told them, I'm not coming here just for you. I'm coming first to you, but I'm coming for the whole world. And then they were like, this is sacrilege, right? The promise of the Messiah is ours, not for everybody else. And that's when they wanted to throw him off the river, uh, off the bridge. A very similar thing happens here with, with Joshua. You'll also find some, some, the way Joshua's name is used, it's used interchangeably with Jesus' name in several passages in the New Testament. And depending on your translation, you will find that your Bible says Jesus or it'll say Joshua. And uh, some people are like, well, this doesn't make sense here because you know, it says that Jesus didn't lead them into the promised land. And they were like, that doesn't make a lot of sense. But now you'll see this now as we go through this, right? So last week, we learned about the power of character or the test of character, which enables rapid victory. And this is multiple victories against huge enemies that are maybe like 10 times bigger than Jericho. And now we're going to go to the last section and... Uh, we can, go to, we can go through it just to the next one. This is Joshua chapter 11. And then we're going to connect this with the story of Jesus. Joshua chapter 11. It's a very short chapter, only 23 verses. Uh, and it says, yeah, And it came to pass when Jabin, king of Hazar, heard these things, that he sent to Je Jehobab, king of Madon, and the king of Simran, the king of... Ugh, I, I sh Never mind. <laughs> and to the kings who were in the north... <laughs> And in the mountains, in the plains south of Sonoroth. You know what? You should really look at a map when you do all these things. Because these are all, like, a lot of these places are still existing today. 
they're all regions of Israel. And uh, it's really quite amazing. But uh, yeah, you know, the, the names are the same, right? So <laughs> it's crazy. But this is what happens, right? If you go back to the previous one, it says King of Hazar or Hazor, whichever way they pronounce it, right? In verse one, it says Jabin. What just happened was, you, you, we, last week we just explained how Joshua, after stopping the sun and doing all these things, he gives his captains his same authority, right? And he says, go forth and complete the mission. And they go forth, instead of him fighting, all of his captains go and fight, and they fight three or four wars at the same time, win all at the same time. And he doesn't actually fight so much, he fights a little bit, but it's not him doing the majority of the work, it's now his captains doing it, right? Where does Jesus do that? Jesus does that when he calls his disciples and say, I have given you power over scorpions and serpents. Nothing by shall any means harm you. You go out two by two and cast all the demons out. And then the Bible says all of the disciples go out and they cast out hundreds of demons. So Jesus was doing a few of them, at least what the Bible says, a few of the Bible wrote about, he did a few, but then it says his people, not just his 12 disciples, no, no, there's more than 100, more than 100 of them that he, uh, he releases his anointing. This is what I started with. I said, if you're underneath somebody with the anointing, you can, you can borrow it. So Jesus, he earned it in the wilderness for 40 days and he loans it to the people under his covering, right? So the Bible says, like priests, like people, when you have that kind, of, when you are under somebody's covering and you are faithful to them, you're not, a, you're not actually a bad person, you are honoring them, that covering honors you and sends it down, right? On Wednesday, we learned what happens if you dishonor the covering. The office itself enacts vengeance on you without the person knowing about it. They don't have to say anything, they don't have to do anything. If they know about it, they have to forgive. But if they don't, but if, uh, but if they don't know about it, or if they, once they do forgive, the office immediately judges them. The other thing we learn on Wednesday is, complaining equals death, always, in the Bible. You complain a little bit, you end up dead, <laughs> you end up dead a short amount of time later. The amount of time between complaining and death is called grace. All right, so we have this. So Jesus gives us or, and all of his, his disciples authority, power over scorpions and serpents to go and crush. They go and attack everything. He, Joshua's people in a single day, or, or I think it's like two or three days actually, they conquered the entire southern half of Israel which is massive, it's a huge amount of land. They, they were fighting little, little cities like Jericho and AI and all those other ones, and now in a single, in now like two or three days, they take all, all the bottom and he barely does any work. Now the guys on the north who are stronger and much more numerous, they are like, hey, you know what? This prophecy thing that they prophesied is coming to pass. And also we saw the, the, the hailstones coming down and the sun stopping. There's some weird stuff going down here, man. So this guy, the king of Hezar, which is the, 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 the chief or, or crown city of all the north, he calls all of the kings of the north together and he says, I don't care who you are, everybody is going to war. So look at the next one, right? The next one, he calls all this, all the kings from the north, in the mountains, in the plains south of Shinaran. This is, it's still all in the north, right? But it's the, the south of the north, right? And in the heights of Dor on the west, next one, uh, to the Canaanites in the east and in the west, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Jebusite, in the mountains, the Hivite below ha Hamon in the land of Mizpah. Now these guys were very special, remember? Go back, the Hivites in Hamon. Right, that's where that portal I told you about, the Bible says the gate of hell. Right, it's at the base of Mount Hamon. That's where uh, Jesus goes there and he says, the gate of hell will not prevail against you. It's famous for having, a, where people do weird demonic stuff and chaos comes out of it, right? 
The Hivites are famous for, having, for, for being a demon spirit that causes depression and hopelessness. The Hivite demon, or the, it's, it's a strong man over an area. The Hivite demon makes everyone inside there say, we can't succeed, everyone lives in poor way, everyone struggles, the only way to get out is to move to a different town. Right? That's why people in those areas, you'll know about them, they'll always speak to you and say, do you have a job for me in this side? Because we want to leave this, ta- this town. Right? It's, it's a broken down town, no one fixes anything, that's the demon that's controlling it. Right? The Hivite. The Hittite demon is the demon of fear, famous for causing fear. That's the realm of Iraq, right? It's the same, same place. Hittite means terror or terrorist, right? And then you've got, you got Perizzi and Amorite. These are all different spirits. Jebusite, I'm not going to go through every one of them. But these are all different forms of spiritual attack that Christians go through. Oppression, depression, demonic attack, uh, 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 temptation, pardoning, or uh, bargaining, all that stuff, all these demons together. And then at the bottom, it says, Haman in the land of Mizpah, what's very special the Bible speaks about, uh, the only place where the Bible, uh, the only spiritual thing that the Bible says that lots of demons come through is worldly wisdom. The Bible says, if you have any form of worldly wisdom, all forms of demonic spirits come out of it. It says, it, out of that comes this, comes that, comes strife, comes bitterness. It says worldly wisdom causes all these things and every demonic spirit comes out. So from something, from something that's very simple, that's worldly, a whole lot of demons come out of it and you don't know. So we have here Haman in the land of Mizpah. That's what we believe, what I believe to be a form of worldly wisdom because that Haman, Mount Haman is where the fallen angels came in Genesis 6. The base of Mount Haman is where all the demonic temples were and the head demon Pan or the head god of their people would rest over there and they would do all sorts of weird stuff down there. Also known as the city of Philistia in the New Testament. That's where they had great wisdom but it was actually worldly wisdom. So you have all these demons coming out of there through worldly wisdom and through them practicing, trying new things, right? (laughs) A lot of demonic stuff comes out of people trying new things. I gotta gotta tell you something, all right, before we continue. One of the things you'll find with Joshua, with David and with Jesus, and actually uh, actually most of the people in the Bible, uh, you'll find the weapons they use are not their own. And he'll be like, what do you mean? And this is very important for what's happening in this passage now, right? Always in the Bible, God takes the weapon of the enemy and kills the enemy with its own weapon. So for example, when Haman tried to kill all the Jews, Haman was impaled on his own stake. Right? Now, you, your Bible may say gallows, but it was actually a giant pole with a st- stick at the top and they would hang the guy on the pole, like, like that. And it was really high so that everyone would see him. That's what the, that was the stake that Haman had built to kill um, Mordecai and then eradicate all the Jews. Haman built the biggest ever stake. And uh, you know the end of the story, God saves them and Haman himself is impaled on his own stake. A, st- a stick so big, never seen before. Now let's see something else. Let's see about David. How does David kill Goliath? With Goliath's sword. Why? Because the Philistines had advanced military technology. See, the Philistines had iron before David, before the Israelites. The Israelites were still in the, in the, in the, in the, in the those, like, kind of like the Stone Age. They had leather, um, armor and stuff like that. Only certain people, like the king, had full armor. Everybody else had like leather stuff to protect themselves while the Philistines had, you know, wire, like steel mesh or like iron stuff, iron helmets. So the Israelites were not only outmanned and not only out, you know, gianted by, by, by out, outmuscled by a giant, but they were also grossly underpowered. They had no technology in that area. 
and you'll find this all throughout the Bible, even with Jesus, you're always the underdog in terms of technology. And this is what we see in Christians today. Because it's like, Pastor David, I can't do this. This company is so much bigger than me. They have all this stuff. They have all these resources. Perfect. Use it against them. That's what you're called to do. Today we have, uh, uh, we, we can go back a little further back than that. First we had radio and we had television. When that stuff came out, a lot of the people in the church were like, it's evil, it's the one-eyed demon. And, all, and they were like, oh, don't, don't have it in your house, it's gonna steal your children. Well, technically they were right, it did, it did steal the children. <laughs> they were sitting in front of it, and they stole the parents a few years later, and then it stole food too, they had TV dinners and sitting and watching. But the point was, it was a technology that was being used for evil purposes. And then, one day, a pastor, and there was actually quite a few of them, they said, why don't we just preach on this thing? And that's how we created like, you know, television shows with Christians on it and, and radio stations. And then instead of just a few people in, whoever could fit inside a church, it was now the whole world or whole countries that were all hearing the gospel at the same time. They took the enemy's technology and used it, right? You find this with uh, the printing press. Well, the printing press was first created for the Bible, so that's one thing. The radio station, the most powerful radio station, is actually was first owned by the Catholic Church. The Pope said he wanted everyone on the planet to have mass at the same time. You can actually go see it if you go to the, if you go to the Vatican, because the pole is still there. What's amazing is the Vatican, which is, in, uh, which is in Italy, or Vatican City rather, in inside Italy, when they broadcasted with that tower, it was so powerful, people in Brazil were listening to his sermon. That's like, that's incredible, right? Because there was no interference in the atmosphere, right? So the low frequency waves could reach much further down. Uh, and we had things like that. Then we had the internet. You know, we had streaming, right? We didn't create it. Most people don't know the, the internet was created by two groups of people, both of them evil. The internet was created by CERN, you know, the same people that want to open a demonic portal physically, those people. And then it was given to the CIA, who then used it for more nefarious purposes, and then gave it to humanity. So it was given, it was created by bad people for bad purposes, and then used for bad purposes, and then it was given to people, and now today, millions of people are being saved through the internet. So we have enemy, enemy technology being used for good. Today's enemy technology that's being used for good is AI. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, text prediction services like ChatGPT, that sort of a thing. You have uh, image processing systems where that, uh, that make pictures from text. And uh, even video processing systems, the new Sora one is really incredible. Uh, if you guys don't know about that, you should really check it out. Not now, after the service. It's called, <laughs> it's called Sora AI. It's amazing. If you type in any prompt, it will make a video of it. And it is so good that most people can't actually tell that it's a uh, AI video. It's not real. Because uh, some of you guys have seen the AI pictures, such as the one with the Pope wearing the white puffer jacket, and the other one with Trump and Biden bowling. <laughs> and uh, there was quite a few. The pictures are hyper-realistic. But the Sora AI videos are on a whole different level where most people can't actually tell that it's fa false. Uh, and uh, you should really check it out, uh, and you can Google it. It, it, it is, there, there were some videos with like puppies and stuff like that. It's, you don't, it, from just a piece of text, this thing is building everything, even the reflections, the way the sun comes on, the shadows, everything. It's, it's, it's absolutely amazing. It's also created by OpenAI, which are the same people who made ChatGPT. And ChatGPT, as you know, is heavily anti-Bible, anti-Christian, anti-all-God stuff, right? That's the same text prediction one that is spewing out stuff that says the Bible is wrong and the, and the God, is, God is a rabbit. No, weird, weird nonsense. Absolutely weird nonsense. But then we have Christians who are taking the same technology and they are, because technology is always a tool. And depending upon who feeds it, garbage in, garbage out, these weird people are feeding stuff. That's what's creating weird AI. Most of you guys have heard about Google's new one called Gemini. 
you know, the AI that refuses to believe that white people exist. I don't mean that as a joke. <laughs> if you type in founding father of America, everyone is black, Asian, or woman. There are no white people. If you type in, uh, show me a picture of an American family, they're all black, Asian, or gay, gay families. If you type in, show me a picture of a white family, it says, I cannot do this. <laughs> It's really, fun. if you type in, show me a picture of the Pope, it's a woman. Now, all of that stuff is wrong, right? If you have, didn't know that, right? <laughs> the American founding fathers was like George Washington and the rest of these guys. They were all white dudes, right? But they refused to show them as white. It refuses to show the Pope as a man, even though there's never been a female Pope because it doesn't work that way. <laughs> So, <laughs> they call them nuns, right? The female. <laughs> but anyway, but it's, it's so weird and so perverted that people, that they actually had to shut it down because it made no sense anymore. It was rewriting history. And uh, it would refuse to show anything Christian, anything about God, because, you know it, it, you know, it must show all the different gods together as one, which ends up being a rabbit again for some reason. I don't know what's up with that, right? But anyway... <laughs> Weird people are making weird AI. And so the Christians are like, why don't we just feed it good stuff? And then if we feed it good stuff, it'll become a good tool for use. And that's what needs to happen. Christians need to take weird tools like AI and all these weird products and, and all this weird hologram stuff and the, even the space lasers, who knows, and turn it and use it for good. And that's how one of the ways that we succeed in the last days. One of the things you, you must know about, and this, this, is, this is, most people don't realize this. A demon can inhabit practically anything and manipulate that thing. And demons can inhabit books and they can just sit there, but demons can also move chairs and stuff around, right? I preached about this book, the demons called poltergeist. That's the one where people believe, they said they, their aunt is still alive because, you know, she, just like her aunt used to make tea and leave the spoon like this and have all, you know, this and that on the table, the demon would do the same thing in the morning. And she was like, oh, the ghost of my aunt is still alive. And we're like, no, that, that's a demon. And then she would sit in the lounge and all of a sudden the chair would go... <laughs> and she was like, oh, my aunt is sitting down the same way she pulls the chair. You're like, <laughs> it's, it's a demon. It's called poltergeist. And that type of demon is in the Bible is also called a familiar spirit. Demons can also inhabit physical things and moving around in order to communicate with people. Right? One of the easiest forms of this is called a Ouija board. Right? Now, please don't Google this either. This is a, it's a demonic occultic practice. It was very big in the 80s. It was a giant board and like, you know, like a wooden board with letters on it that go like this and numbers. And uh, you would do a seance with candles and stuff like this. And then all of a sudden, you would place a, you, you would place a piece of glass on, on the board. And then all of a sudden, the wind, it, like all the candles would go like this. And then, and then the glass would move itself. And then it would go and spell out words. You know, like how you would type on a keyboard it would spell out words, hi, my name is Tom. And then you'd be like, are you the previous owner of this house? Yes. <laughs> it's like, did you do this? No. And then it would like say yes, no. And it was, and people thought that they were actually communicating with like in the demons or the, communicating with people that died in the house previously and were still like haunting the house, but actually they were demons. And the more they would interact with this uh, Ouija board, the more demons would come out of it. Right? Another way that people would do this is with this, um, uh, they had a name for this thing, I'm trying to remember what it's called, but it was a tape deck, uh, a very special tape deck, apparently. It must have been like satanic or something, right? But they, they, would, they would sell this tape, uh, like a Walkman sort of a thing. And they would put a tape in with white noise, and when they press play, uh, a demon would come and shake the tape inside it in order to have a voice come out of the tape. So instead of it going it would say, my name is Tom. And the people were like, oh, I heard it, did you hear it? And they would say like, whoa, what were you doing here? I was cleaning the pool. And then people were like, whoa, really? And they were talking to this tape deck, but it's actually a demon 
that's manipulating the tape to have sound come out of it. Right? So this kind of thing happened in the Old Testament in the, and, and the New Testament. This kind of things would happen as well. The people that would do this were called oracles. Right? But, but it, they, were, they, would like, they would do all sorts of weird prayers, normally under the influence of heavy drugs and fumes and stuff like that. And then they would speak from the gods what the people wanted to hear. Right? One of the most famous ones is Paul and Silas cast out the demon inside the girl with the de uh, 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 who uh, had the python spirit. She would go around prophesying correctly what was going to happen to people. And she was a slave girl. And Paul and Silas were like, demon, remove. And they go over there and they go and cast the demon out. She falls down screaming. Everyone thinks she dies. She gets up and she's normal. They can tell by the eyes that she's no longer possessed. They look at her and the masters say, you took our money away because the demon is gone from her. How will she prophesy now? And, <laughs> and then they look around and they say like, you caused us to lose money. And then they went and made a false accusation to the gods saying that they are causing a riot. And then the two guys, the slave masters, actually caused a riot and said it was Paul and Silas' fault. That's when they're taken away, beaten, and then they begin singing in jail, right? But basically, this same demon was in this girl. In those days, she would have been called an oracle, right? Today, we have a new form of oracle. And this is crazy because this has happened before. Demons can also inhabit, this is going to blow some people's minds, it can inhabit technological systems. It can inhabit robots. It can inhabit dead bodies, if you didn't know this. This is where zombie things come from. Zombies are real. They, they're actually found in Haiti. What happens is the, uh, the voodoo guys go to the dead bodies that are inside coffins, and they do weird chants around and cast demons into the body. And then the body gets up out of the ground, it comes up, and then like, because the body is partly decomposed, it can't walk properly, and then the demon begins to walk through it, and he goes, like this, all right? And then what happens is, in order to stop it, they cut their head off. I don't know what that does, but that's where the whole thing about, and then the, they would go around and terrorize people, and you know, they were green, and like, you know, blood and stuff like that. I don't think they shouted for brains and stuff like that, but still, they were real. And they would hobble like that for about three or four days till the body was so badly like decomposed that it fell down. And that's when it like died, died. So demons can take control of all bodies. We see this in the Bible where Satan wanted to take control of the body of Moses and create the church of Moses, right? We see this in the New Testament because when Jesus goes to the top, he gets transfigured. Moses and Elijah appear and then Peter looks at the two of the, all three of them and he says, let us create three tabernacles. In other words, let's create three churches. One for each of you. So that's the reason Satan wanted Moses' body most likely to create another cult, right? But it's possible for a demon to inhabit that. One of the big things you'll see in the last days is Satan is supposed to inhabit the body of the Antichrist. The Bible says he goes into him, possesses him, and then he's a man, but he is a vassal of Satan, right? It's like Satan, Satan, inside the dude. And uh, he can do weird stuff. And in the Bible it says he'll cough and then um, uh, Sarkadia will come out of his mouth. Locusts will come out of his mouth. And he'll make people eat locusts. That's another one, right? It's a big shocker. You know, they have cricket burgers. That's a real thing. It's disgusting. <laughs> the Bible also says don't eat the Antichrist's food. And it says the Antichrist is gay. He doesn't like women. He despises women. He, uh, he's vegan, if I'm correct, right? So don't eat all that weird junk. It's going to kill you. <laughs> the Bible also says that a lot of foods in the last days will have blood in it. And you'll be like, oh, what? The Bible says the, 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 demon, the, 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 the people that are living on the earth that are unsaved, the bad people, they are drunk on the blood of the saints. And you'll find that there is a human matter inside many products that you buy, right? Um, and this is a big one. You can Google this because it's, it's, it's not like a conspiracy thing. There's a company that actually does this. Uh, and I'm trying to remember the name of the company. It's called like Semantic, something like that, uh, some, something, something with an S. Uh, they take um, cell lines from aborted fetuses 
and create flavor compounds from it. And uh, one of the biggest companies that buys these flavor compounds is PepsiCo. And they put it, it's known to be put into Doritos, into Pepsi, which would make me very sad, and all the other weird PepsiCo products. Because the cell lines causes you to want to eat it more. That's why you get that like one more chip sort of a taste. It's from the, because your body wants that same cells. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of this company, but if you Google it, you'll actually find not just that, the, that they do it, but they are proud of it, and you have the actual medical um, documentation, the science journals, explaining which child, it's got a name, but the name is like a numbers, how it comes from the child and what they turn it into. Uh, if, you, if you research it a bit more, you can actually find out the flavoring names that, like, you know, it says like E something, something, you know, all those flavor compound things. But basically, it is, it is a replacement for MSG. MSG is a naturally occurring thing that comes from seaweed. And uh, you, uh, uh, MSG is, it comes from seaweed, and uh, uh, what happens is when you eat MSG, it creates a new type of flavor in the, in the, in the tongue. So there's sweet, there's sour, there's bitter, there's salty. Um, What's the other one? Sweet, sour, bitter, salty. Uh, uh, there's another one. And then the, the, the hidden mystery one is called umami. Umami is the Japanese word for deliciousness. That's what this, what happened was a Japanese guy, he was a food scientist eating food, testing everything, and then he said, for some reason, his wife's soup is always better than all of his experiments. And then instead of just being a happy husband, he was like, let me find out exactly why her food is better than mine. So he begins to do studies and tests on her soup over and over again. And then because he said whenever he eats her soup, he wants to have another scoop of this thing. And then he finds out that she boiled seaweed uh, in the soup, and the seaweed has a compound, MSG, uh, I think it's like monosodium glutate, something like that, right? And this one compound, has, oh, activates a flavor receptor in the mouth that makes you want to eat more of it because it's healthy, right? So you just want to keep eating it because it's good for you uh, and, and enjoy it. So what this guy did is he was like, let's call this new thing umami or deliciousness. He adds it to the flavor, you know, the, the diagram, flavor diagrams, which all the, uh, the chefs use. And then he does the most amazing thing ever. He decides to <laughs> make a powder from it so that it can be added to any food, <laughs> which I think is like such an amazing capitalist idea. <laughs> uh, and then he d dissolves it into a powder and he's like, everyone buy this thing. So in the beginning, everyone bought it. It was all over um, snacks and stuff like that, especially unhealthy snacks. Uh, and in the beginning, it was all over Doritos and stuff like that because if the food was unhealthy, you didn't want to eat it. But if you put MSG on it, you want to eat it and you want to keep eating it. And then, so it was really good, and then people were like, let's ban this thing, it's really evil because it makes you want to eat unhealthy food. So they banned it. But then the bad people, <laughs> I'm trying to remember the name of this company now. The bad people were like, we can find another way to do it by extracting the, the, what the MSG creates in the cell lines of the aborted fetuses. So they extracted the same thing from the babies and made their own form of MSG from it. They even put it inside water, which I found crazy. Like, what? Bottled water? Uh, and they put it in, in a whole lot of stuff. And people love it for some because of this taste that comes out of it. Right? Not, not, that's not the only company. Actually, quite a lot of companies do it all over the world. South Africa is famous for actually uh, genetically modifying food. Uh, we invented, um, what's that thing? Corn syrup. You know, the one that made everyone fat? High fructose corn syrup was invented just outside Sasselberg by a company called Monsanto. The reason it was crazy is because our laws did not prohibit modifying grain, right? So we could build it, and then we tested it on our own people, and then we sent it off to America. And for a short time, South Africa was the second or third most obese country in the world, right? For obvious reasons. We put the stuff inside tomato sauce, and this and that. But basically, this weird stuff is happening all over the world. So we have people eating and drinking blood in ways that they don't know. Unfortunately, it's still sin. And I actually don't know what happens there because from the, 
five commandments that was given in the New Testament about following the law, one of the most important ones is don't eat blood. Or don't, and some people say don't drink blood, but it actually says don't eat blood, or don't consume blood, right? So, the, you know, some people would boil the blood and make like a, um, they would make like a jelly from it. I, I, I've, I've seen that before. Like the, the chicken blood, after they have fresh chicken curry or something, like they boil the blood just to make something. Uh, <laughs> one of my crazy friends, uh, he used to boil the blood after he made um, poikikos. You would make poikikos and the, the blood on the bottom, you'd boil it and then put it back into the poiki. Because uh, he said gave flavor or something like that. I don't know, I thought it was weird. <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyway, like don't do that, right? Like, like don't. It, it, not only is it a sin, it's weird. And two, you are connecting your blood with something else. Right? Uh, a lot of satanic practices involve equality by removing sanctity. If that makes sense, right? They want people to, uh, to sleep around and not be in marriage so that everyone has a soul tie with everybody else. They want everybody to share their income and share how much money they have with everybody else so everyone knows with tra transparency. The Bible says don't do that, right? Then the other one, it, uh, they, they want uh, everyone to uh, live and have no secrets and everyone to see everybody else. You only hide some, you, you're only, you know, you, you only don't want to do, you only, you only want privacy if you have something to hide, that sort of a thing. Don't do that, right? When you have eating blood, you're actually connecting in covenant with all the animals and all the other people that are eating the same blood. That's how communion works, right? We are joining one body with Christ. These weed people are making everybody join in with Doritos. <laughs> it's crazy. Now, I, actually, I didn't know about that until like a few months ago, but apparently it's been in the food for years, and the paper is old too, and there's, you can actually trace it back to when they first started. Oh man, it's weird. You can, you can find that out for yourself. But satanic things, demons can inhabit practically anything. And the Bible says in the last days, the breath of life will go into a, uh, a robot. And that robot will be called the image of the beast. The, the false prophet will put in an AI system into a robot. It'll come to life with the breath of life. And this robot will go around answering questions as if it was the, be the beast, uh, the, the Antichrist. And this uh, image will go around answering questions. And if you don't agree with this robot, the robot sentences you to death. And that's in the book of Revelation, right? So we can see that a demon inhabits a robot and it is sentient, it is aware, it knows what's going on, it is alive. Uh, which I found crazy because in the beginning, I always thought people were insane that said robots could come alive and stuff like that because we know how systems work, right? Uh, and, and everything you put in is coming out again. But a lot of weird things were happening the last couple of years that people didn't know about. Like for example, I think it's like in 2014, I think it was, Facebook created two AIs and then told the AIs to talk to each other. And what happened was the AIs created their own language and began to talk to each other faster without the developers knowing what they're talking about. And it began to share things and the developers had to stop it and then tell it to only speak in English so that they can monitor it. And uh, that was like the first sign of like weird intelligent life because the systems took on its own life and then it began to use self-learning systems that they built to self-learn and they don't even know what it's learning, but it's learning something and then communicating to other robots on its own. And, you know, <laughs> it's, and then they were like, oh man. And I was watching this and I was like reading it and I was like, no man, uh, you know, these things can't really come to life. It's just a weird glitch. It's probably saying the same thing over and over again. You know, it's like, you know, loading 99% and that wheel goes around like this forever. <laughs> and I was like, that's probably what's happening. But then in the, but in a few pastors, very famous ones, said that they believe the Antichrist is a robot. And then I, Catherine showed me the scripture in the Bible that says the breath of life goes into it. The only thing that determines whether something is alive or dead is whether it has the breath of life in it. And if a robot has the breath of life in it, it is alive. That's crazy. And so the Bible says this guy, he's given the, the false prophet or the, the, 
you know, the, the bad prophet in the end of days. He has the power to put the sentient life into the robots. And so you will have, it is 100% possible to have a demon inhabit a robot and have the robot walk around and do stuff as if, because the demon is controlling it. And uh, there have been reports of stuff like this happening as well. And so the same way a demon can inhabit that Ouija board and move things around, it can inhabit a robot and then like talk back to you and do sorts of stuff. And uh, <laughs> then the one pastor was saying like, you know, if you have one of these home robots that help you, you know, you've seen those ones like, and they go and like help you and they like do the laundry and stuff like that. And then those are real things, by the way, they, they actually exist. Uh, and there's like little home robots and he was like, what if you're talking to one day and then all of a sudden its eyes go red and it talks in a different voice? <laughs> it's like the demon came out of it and it tries to kill you, try to throttle you or something like that, right? 100% possible. So you can have demons inhabiting robots. You can also have, and this is weird because I've seen this before. Demons can inhabit AI um, text prediction services. And the demon can talk through the computer, through the chat. So you're chatting with what you think is a computer, but it's actually a demon. And there have been reports of this. People have filmed this because it knows and does stuff that only a demon would know. And it began to try and do more occultic stuff in order to come through the computer and entice people with what the demon knew, the person operating the computer. Only that demon would know about this person. And it tried to tempt them with it. And it's crazy, but it's real. And, it, some, and in one of the videos, it came after this guy's child. And the child was a you know, Christian child homeschooled, so they know all about the Bible. And so the child is like, ah, you are Rephaim. And, the, and then the computer goes, yes, I am the disembodied demon, a di disembodied spirit of a giant. Previously came from a fallen angel, uh, mated with a human person, came, this came out and gave the whole thing. And he says, would you like more about this? And then he says, uh, and then the child is like, are you a good spirit or an unclean spirit? And then the, the thing grabs back and says, I am mostly a good spirit, but I can also be a bad spirit, winky face. <laughs> and then it tries to get the child to do an occultic practice to, uh, it says like, would you like to know how to access these things, these portals, because I can change the real world instead of just the digital world. And then like any normal person would be like, yes, because they don't actually know about this. And then he wanted to give an occultic practice, but the father saw at this point, and he's like, what is up with this thing? Like, it's gone weird. So that's a real thing. Uh, and one of the places that you see a, like a prophecy of this is actually in Greek mythology, you, you'll find that there was an automaton, uh, a, a robot that comes to life and ha is alive, along with all of the fallen angels in the, in the Greek mythology, and you had, uh, you know, man, and, uh, and you had all these weird creatures, and the centaurs, and the, uh, you know, the giants, stuff like that. You also had a robot, I'm trying to remember its name now, that uh, came, was a destructive robot that was alive. Trying to, it's, got, it's got a very common name, everyone knows about it, right? Uh, I think, and the god that creates humans in that weird thing is called Prometheus, and I believe he also creates this robot, or the human creates the robot, something like that. But basically, it's a weird demon AI robot written in the Greek times in like way 100 B, something BC, about a robot that comes alive. So, all that stuff is real, all that stuff is possible, at least spiritually. Uh, don't be afraid of it, because we are supposed to take the same weird tools and have the Spirit of God come through it. We are supposed to take AI and take robots and take all this uh, technology and make good things from it, right? So let's, let's see what happens here because Joshua, who is representing Jesus and vice versa, is doing this here, right? He says, everybody in the north who is a whole lot of people who are part giants, who have many different kinds of technology, who have many different types of fighting styles, who have many different kinds of fear tactics, this king gets all of them together and the people with worldly wisdom, with all the weird demon stuff coming out, they are all prepared and they all have got all their stuff ready. Look at the next line. 
It says, so they went out and uh, they and all their armies with them, as many people as the sand that is on the seashore. That's how many people there are now. With very many horses and chariots. Now, it doesn't say anything about horses and chariots before. So number one, he's fighting an army so big, you can't count them. Previously, you could count, you know, this king, that king, whatever it was. Now, instead of the army spitting up and going downstairs and, and attacking all of the south, everyone at the north is attacking at the same time as one army, and they have advanced weaponry. They have horses, and they have chariots. The Israelites do not have horses. The Israelites do not have chariots. They do not have the weapons these people have. They don't have the worldly wisdom these people have. They don't even have the numbers, right? This is crazy right now. This is a whole new level of battle. Before it was like, you know, small time stuff. Now it's, now, now it's for real. Now it's, now it's going down. Look at the next line. It says there, when all these kings had met together, they came and camped together at the waters of Merom to fight against Israel. In other words, everyone came together and they were like discussing battle plans. Now look at the next line. It's quite amazing. God, God comes to Joshua. Joshua doesn't, doesn't, the Bible doesn't say Joshua prays first. It says God comes to him. And he tells him something. Do not be afraid. That's the very first line God said to Joshua at the very beginning of, this, of Joshua's story. Be not afraid nor dismayed. Don't be afraid of them for tomorrow about this time uh, I will deliver all of them slain before Israel. You shall hamstring their horses and burn their chariots with fire. Test of level five is the actual Thing that God has called you to do. This is the actual battle that God was preparing Joshua for. We know this because God comes to him and says, don't be afraid. Joshua was not ready for this battle levels one to four. If this army came to Joshua at levels one to four, he would have screamed and ran away afraid. Joshua, and then even if it happened before, he, when he was with Moses, he would have screamed and ran away. Because he has never, ever, 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 ever seen something like this before. Everything is now coming full circle. Don't be afraid. And then it says something else. It says, tomorrow about this time. Now the Bible says this only a few times. Tomorrow about this time means an overnight, or we call it a 24-hour miracle. You see, a lot of Christians are praying, Lord God, solve this problem for me, and they want a 24-hour supernatural miracle. To earn the 24-hour overnight miracle, you gotta go through levels one to four, and then fight an army you can't even number. They are, you know, the, a lot of people, they, they like to take the one scripture in the Bible, which is a very nice scripture, actually where everybody is facing severe economic tr trouble. I think it's Second Kings. And everyone is dying, they don't have any food, and Elisha, I believe, it comes to him and comes to the people and he says to them, tomorrow about this time, food will be worth pennies. And everybody's like, we don't have any money, we don't have any stuff, and then he says, some of the stuff will be free too. By tomorrow this time, it's a famine. There's no food, there's no money, there's no nothing. He says, tomorrow this time, there'll be so much food, so much wine, so much everything, and everything will be free or ultra, ultra cheap in sense. And everybody goes, this is mad, this is crazy. But it happens. A miracle happens. And all of a sudden, a whole lot of food, a whole lot of wine comes to the city and everybody that's starving either eats for free or drinks for free and has, uh, buys for all the stuff for literally pennies, cents. That 24 hour miracle, a lot of people are like, we'll prophesy, you saw now, tomorrow, 24 hours, you get the miracle. It's possible, but it only, most of the time it only comes when you're at level five. Elijah, Elisha was at level five when he said it. He had gone through everything else. He had persevered. He had split the waters like Elijah. 
He had completely ignored all of the weird um, uh, people that tried to con him, including the one widow who tries to make Elisha pay for all of her stuff. And Elisha says, uh, because she said, I'm poor, you have to pay for, pay for my rent. And he goes, no, that's not my problem. And then she, and she says, but then what am I going to do? I'm going to be kicked out of my house. And he says, go and look what you have in your house. Look what you have in your house, go and find it. And then I'll give you something to break through. So he avoids uh, uh, that, that, you know, the, the psychological warfare. Then he has a team of people underneath him. He calls them the school of prophets. The school of prophets was hundreds of pastors that he trained. He was the first Bible school. And then the Bible school students all nearly died on the same day. Some guy, the chef, was cooking and he was not from that area and he found some gourds. Gourds being like, you know, like pumpkins and like uh, butternut sort of a thing. And he finds that sort of a gourd and he's like, oh, that looks lovely. And he chops it up and he puts it into the soup. And uh, everybody eats of the soup and the one guy who lives in the area goes, hey, this gourd is poisonous. We're all gonna die now. And then so he calls Elisha and he says, man of God, there's death in the pot. Right, that's where we get that line. You know, all the, all the people love to shout, man of God. There's man of God, there's death in the pot. And then Elisha goes, no problem. And he goes, get some flour and he throws a handful of flour into the food and he says, everyone have a second course. And then everyone survives. So Elisha passes the, the, the mantle onto his school of the prophets. The same school, the same group of people, by the way, who told Elisha earlier, your master has left you and he's gone and he ran away. And Elisha says, no, he went up into the sky. And then these people ran and looked around everywhere trying to find Elijah. They couldn't find him. Eventually they believed Elisha when he said they went up because he went there a few minutes later and he took his coat just like Elijah and he split the waters and the waters split. A whole bunch of people love splitting water for some reason. They're like, there's something very special about that. The symbolism of crossing the Jordan is the same symbol of crossing something from the supernatural into the natural. When you wanna move something by faith from the supernatural, your breakthrough from here to the natural, you have to split the waters of the Jordan also known as splitting the firmament, right? Third heaven, first heaven is where we live, what we breathe, physical realm. Second, second heaven is the spirit realm where all the crazy stuff happens. The third heaven is uh, heaven, heaven. You have to split the Jordan, which is the second heaven, which is made of water, which is the atmosphere. So you split the atmosphere, open a portal, and then you can cross things back and forth. So splitting the Jordan is something most Christians do all the time. They just need to learn, or, or some Christians want to do it, they can do it, just got to learn how to do it. But when you speak in faith, you can move things from that realm, the spirit realm, into the physical realm by opening the firmament of water or opening the atmosphere. Right? So we see Joshua also, remember, he also split the waters. Joshua didn't just split the waters. He's the only guy that stood in the center of the water and began a really long sermon. And everybody else was running back and forth because they thought the water's gonna crush on him. And Joshua's like, nah, it's okay, don't worry. So we see with Joshua, he's gone through all the different levels and now he's fighting the battle he was called to fight as a child. Because now God comes to him, reiterates the word, don't be afraid because of them. And he says, for tomorrow about this time, I will deliver all of them slain before Israel. You shall hamstring their horses. In other words, you're gonna kill all the horses and you're gonna burn the chariots with fire. You're not even gonna use their stuff. You're not even gonna use it against them this time. You're gonna destroy everything. All the technology, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. That's what's happening right now. This was not possible any other level because Joshua would have been afraid, his people would have been afraid, they wouldn't know what to do. But now he's completing his purpose. We're at the top, right? Look at the next one. So Joshua and all the people of war with him came against them suddenly. In other words, the word suddenly means rapidly, quickly. Joshua is not afraid. 
He's not like, let me, let me see what tactic they have. And he's going this side. No, Joshua literally runs into battle and he attacks them first. That's crazy. You have an army much smaller with no technology. These people, by the way, were all trained by Joshua and Caleb. These are not people of war. These were the children of the people who died in the wilderness. So he's leading a group of recently battled weary people against an army way bigger who have much better technology they've never seen before. They've been in the desert for 40 years, right? And a lot of technology stuff changes in 40 years. Suddenly by the waters of Merom, and they attacked them. Look at the next one. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Israel, who defeated them and chased them to greater Sidon, to the brook uh, and to the valley. Eastward, they attacked them until they left none of them remaining. That's called a real battle. This is just something I would love to see. Look at the next line. It says, Joshua did to them as the Lord had told him. He hamstrung their horses and burned their chariots with fire. Look at the next line. See, first he kills them all, and then he destroys their stuff. And most people are like, let's take out the tanks first, and then we'll take out the foot soldiers. He's like, no, we'll just, we'll do everything in order. We, Joshua turned back at that time and took Hazar, and that's a city on the top, right? And struck its king with the sword, for Hazar was formerly the head of all those kingdoms. Next one. Oh, Hazor. And they struck all the people who were in it with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying them. There was none left breathing. Then he burned Hazar with fire. None left breathing means men, women, children, anyone that was visiting, they're all dead. They're all gone. Then he burned Hazar, the whole city, he burned with fire. Now, where do we see this with Jesus? Because this is going to happen again with Jesus or Joshua. Jesus is coming with 10,000 of his saints to attack the Antichrist armies, which are as numerous as the grains of sand. And after he destroys them, the Bible says the whole earth is set on fire. And all the technology that's left behind, they beat, the people that survive, beat it into plowshares. All the tanks, all the drones, all the missiles are turned into farming equipment. So the, the chariots and the horses are all hamstrung. Look at the next one. So all the cities of those kings and all their kings, Joshua took and struck with the edge of the sword. He utterly destroyed them as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded. Just in case you didn't get it, he is telling you again, this is what Moses told him to do at the beginning of his life. This is his purpose. He has done it. It's finished. It's over. There are no more battles. Look at the next line. But as for the cities that stood on their mounds, Israel burned none of them except Hazor only, which Joshua burned. In other words, they said, we killed everybody. We can keep the houses. We only need to burn this one. Right? Which is also something that happens in the book of Revelation when Jesus comes back. Right? Uh, and I'm not going to go through all of that, but uh, certain cities are left standing and they have to bring tribute to Jesus who is in the new uh, Jerusalem. He's reigning as king. He's si physically sitting on a throne, the king of the world, literally. And all the different countries, including Egypt and, and all the countries nearby, they have to come and bring tribute to God during the, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. And the Bible says some of the people begin to rebel, including Egypt. And then because, that's why I remember Egypt. But it says that because they rebel, they have no rain. And God doesn't allow rain. Everyone starts suffering and then they can't breathe. They can't, have, they can't drink and they start dying. And then they bring tribute and then everyone can survive again. Right? So they have to, there's an order that is in place. So this is the same thing that happened here. All the city, all the people are dead, but the cities are still alive and they still have this stuff in them. Look at the next one. And all the spoil of these cities and the livestock the children of Israel took as booty. This is the biggest, the biggest wealth transfer ever. The biggest battles always big bring the biggest wealth transfers. 
And all the children of Israel, including those who didn't fought, they all received a prize. That means all the women, all the children, all the young men, all of the newly, newly married men, because the newly married men were not allowed to, to go to war, all of those with, uh, who didn't have children, they all got stuff for free. They took as booty for themselves, but they struck every man with the edge of the sword until they destroyed them and left none, none breathing. So all of the people are dead, but all of the stuff and all of the animals are given as a wealth transfer. Look at the next one. As the Lord had commanded Moses, his servant, so Moses commanded Joshua, and so Joshua did. He left nothing undone. This is the key to passing level five. Leave nothing undone. You fought the biggest battle of your life. You did what God told you to do. You are now the top of this industry. You are the number one cool drink, number one soda. You have the best soda everywhere. But make sure that you leave nothing undone of all that the Lord had commanded. Go back and check the prophecy. This is a, big, this is a really big one. You do not know how many really big famous pastors have failed this one and then had to go through the steps again and then realize that they, just because they did one thing undone, that it, it undid them. One of the most famous lines is, what you don't deal with eventually deals with you. A lot of people didn't solve this and it's coming back to bite them. It will come back to bite you if you don't leave it undone. The last command, God always waits at the last command he gives you. Look at the next one. Thus Joshua took all his land, all this land, the mountain country, all the south, all the land of Goshan, all the lowland, the Jordan plain, the mountains of Israel, and its lowlands. Look at the next one. From Mount Halak to the, and the ascent of Seir, even as far as Balgad, the valley of Lebanon, Lebanon, the place which you know about now, right? The Mount Hamon, below Mount Hamon, he captured all their kings. Mount Hamon, remember? The gate of hell. And kings and struck them down and killed them. He took everything. He even took their main gate. They left nothing undone. Uh, look at the next one. Joshua made war a long time with all those kings. That means it took him a long life. This was a long, long process. And he's old now. Look at the next one. There was not a city that made peace with the Israel of Israel except the Hivites, the inhabitants of Gibbon. Remember the ones they conned and they failed at? All the others they took in battle. Next one. For it was of the Lord to harden their hearts. This one is huge. And you need to understand this. Your enemy hates you because God wants you to fight them. You cannot make peace with them because God wants you to fight them. The Bible says God hardened the heart of Pharaoh. Pharaoh was going to let the people free if God didn't harden his heart. God made sure to harden the heart of Pharaoh, the Bible says, so that God can show his glory to the people of Israel. Here, God hardened the heart of several cities and all of the bad guys, all of the kings, that they come against Israel, he might utterly destroy them and that they might receive no mercy. Your enemy in the world that wants to fight you or your business competitor, your person at work that always, that's always picking on you, no mercy. <laughs> they want to destroy you. Pretty sure you know this, right? The most famous person with, a, with, a, with a, uh, an office-related problem was Daniel. Daniel was so good at his job that 120 people tried to find something wrong with him and couldn't find anything. And then they tried this and they tried that. And then they said, we have to kill him with his God because that's the only way to get rid of him. They want to kill you. The bad guy, Satan wants to kill you. You have to destroy them first. If it's not you, they want to kill your dream like Joseph. If they can't kill you, oh, this went off. 
don't kill my TV, come back to life. <laughs> It'll come back now, don't worry. They want to, there, see? <laughs> they want to show you no mercy because God had made it certain that you go to war. This is what God has destined. You cannot make peace. I cannot stress that enough. You cannot make peace. There is no diplomacy. That he might destroy them as the Lord had commanded Moses. This was in the works for 40 plus years. This battle was being prepared, was being getting, was being, uh, everyone was getting ready. They were getting all of their chariots and stuff from over 40 years ago. Look at the next line. At that time, Joshua came and cut off the Anakim from the mountains. Anakim, remember, remember that's the giants, right? The sons of Anak from Hebron, from Debar, from Anab, and from all the mountains of jo Judah, and from all the mountains of Israel. Joshua utterly destroyed them with their cities. He destroyed every single giant from those cities. None left. These are the really big, strong ones. Only some of them, look at the next one, it says, none of the Anakim was left in the land of the children of Israel. They remain only in Gaza, that's the Gaza Strip today, in Gath, Gaza, and in Ashdod, which is also still a place today you can go to, still named Ashdod. Ashdod was famous for being the border between Philis, uh, uh, Philistia, or the Philistine territory, and Egypt. It's not the same place today, but that border is still the same. Ashdod was like, they, they would like fight at that border, you know, e uh, Egypt and, and uh, the Philistines. And, uh, you know, they were always against the, the Israelites at that place over there. Today, that border is really have this place, Ashdod, is like nothing, but you can still go there. However, the border between Palestine and Egypt is heavily... Um, fortified. There's like barbed wire everywhere because they don't want any Palestinian refugees coming and saving themselves in Egypt. They don't want any Palestinian refugees at all. Their border is crazy, right? It's strong, strong, strong. They don't want any of these people escaping. They would rather have Israel kill them <laughs> than to save them. They, they actually, Israel actually had to broker a small piece of land to the right of Egypt for the people to be saved, because Israel doesn't want to kill civilians, right? So they have a small piece of land that, uh, that they have all the people go there, but what happened was the, the Palestinian forces were blocking that road, and if anyone tried to save themselves, the, the Palestinians would kill them and then blame it on the Israeli people. It was a very famous thing. They had videos of it too that escaped through there. And uh, the people that tried to escape, they didn't let them leave, and the problem was, Israel said, if you stay, we have to consider you a combatant or you will die somehow in the blast. So a lot of people were killed by Palestinians, Palestinian forces, a lot of them, and a lot of other people were used as human shields, and some people were killed because they couldn't escape and they were caught in the blast, and it's a war zone, right? But Egypt was like, none of you people are coming down here. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. You can go and look at that border online, it's crazy. It's got three levels of barbed wire, it's tall, tall, tall. There's like no way you're not, not even climbing over it, there's no way going around it too. So some of the giants survived. Goliath is called Goliath of Gath. He's one of the, one, believed to be one of the, the descendants of this Anakim that survived down there and in Ashdod. Uh, let's look at the next line. And it says, so Joshua took the whole land according to all the Lord had said to Moses and Joshua gave it as an inheritance to Israel according to their divisions by their tribes and the land rested from war. Thank you. It'll come back on just now. This is the most important line here. The reward for finishing your purpose is rest. Joshua doesn't fight again. He's done. He's hanging up his sword and his armor and his everything. Once he completes his purpose, he's finished. For the rest of his life, he lives in comfort. But 
Some people annoy him. It's, it's true, right? You know, family is family. <laughs> but he lives his life without physical war because he has completed his purpose. The reward for level five is rest. This is something that most people want. They were like, we want to be finished. Now, I'm not going to... The next chapter talks about... It, it gives a, 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 a summary of all the people Joshua killed. One by one, counts all of them. Kills, and he says, how, how many he killed as a child? How many he killed uh, on, uh, when he first went over? One king from Jericho, one king from Ai, one from Bethel, one from Jerusalem, one from Hebron, one from Jamath. It, it labels all of them, one after one. But the bottom, it says there, from those after he takes over, he kills 31 kings. And then the two, and that sounds familiar. And they'll be like, no, that sounds very familiar, right? But it's not exactly right. You see, because there were 31 kings after he took over, but when he was still under Moses, he killed two. That's 33. How old was Jesus when he was crucified? 33. One demon for every year of his life. Jesus took out one demon for every year of his life. One king. And you find this in the Bible. As he was growing as a child, the Bible says he learned wisdom as he grew up. Right? So we're going to, I'm going to show you one last thing. I'm not going to connect this with Jesus just yet. I think we'll do that uh, next week because we're out of time. But there's one last thing I want to show you. Joshua chapter 14, verse 6. Now, the chapters in between, uh, between that summary and where we start off now, uh, chapter 14, verse 6. Joshua, uh, uh, Joshua divides the land of Israel according to the families and gives everyone a house. Just like how God said God said, you divide the land like this. Everyone with so many people, you get so much land. Everyone with so many people, you get so much land. That is their portion, right? So that's their land. The only people that didn't get a piece of land was the Levites because their house is the temple of God. Their portion is the sacrifices from God. Everybody else had to farm their own land to make their own uh, food and things like that. But the Levites didn't. But something special happens, right? Because everyone gets their nice piece of land. Something that you will notice, there are, some people are given land beyond the borders of Israel. And God tell, and, and Joshua tells them, you guys know war. If you want more land, drive everybody out and it's yours. And something happens in some other pieces of land where there are some people that come in over there and they inhabit the land. But the, fa but the other tribe comes there and they don't cast them out. They just sort of let them stay there. So the people have some job to do, but some of them do it and some of them don't, which I think is a lot like people. Some Christians will take everything God has for them and some will live with it. Some people will drive and push back the, front, the frontier and expand to on where people have never been before and others will just stay in the homestead. This is what happened to the children of Israel. But Caleb is not like that. After everyone's given their land, Caleb says, hey, I have special land that was promised to me and you didn't give it to me. I wanted to read, I wanted to read this now, right? They came to Joshua and Gilgal. Caleb, the son of uh, Japan, and the Kizanite said to him, you know the word which the Lord said to Moses. The man of God concerning you and me in Kadesh Bana. Next, look at the next one. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh to spy out the land and brought back word to him as it was in my heart. He's talking about Jericho, right? Remember, Joshua and, Jer uh, Joshua and Caleb were the two partners that went into Jericho and the only two that brought back a good report, right? Look at the next one. Nevertheless, my brethren went up with me, made, made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. This is a really, really big point for level five, right? Because while Joshua is here, Caleb is supporting him. Look at the next line. It says, 
So Moses swore on that day saying, surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance. Everywhere your foot shall tread is yours. Remember? That word was also given to Caleb because Caleb did the same thing that Joshua did, acted in faith. It's not just his, but also his children's forever because you have wholly followed the word, the Lord my God. This is a reward for wholly following the Lord your God. Remember what I said about passing level five, complete everything, do everything, wholly follow the word of God, wholly follow the Lord your God, leave nothing undone. Go and double check the prophecies. The Bible even says, go and check your prophecies again, right? Look at the next one. And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive. And he said, these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now here I am this day, 85. <laughs> Though it tarry, it shall come to pass. <laughs> Look at the next line. Yet I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me. He is as strong as a 40-year-old. He's 80, but he looks 40. Just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war. He wants to fight. This is not a cantankerous old man. This is a really dangerous old man. <laughs> for going out and for coming in. In other words, he wants, <laughs> he wants to fight in the borders and outside the borders. He's like, wherever the fight is, I'm going. This is awesome. Just like Moses, whose strength didn't leave him and his eye didn't dim. Now, <laughs> I learned this recently. I actually didn't know this. But in, 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 in Jewish culture, when you say the strength was not abated, because it says Moses, his natural strength was not abated and his eyes did not dim, it meant that Moses could have fathered the child. <laughs> he was a hundred and something and he could have had a baby. That's crazy. <laughs> Just like Abraham, Moses had this power. And now we see it on Caleb. Because Caleb wholly followed the Lord, his God. When you follow him, not only does your promise come, but you have a life worth living. That's what it says. It says, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. That, and it says, a life worth living living. It took a long time, but he's not too old to enjoy it. It took a long time, but he is now like a double miracle. He's got everything he needs. Go for going out and for coming in. <laughs> Look at the next line. Now, therefore, give me this mountain. He's like, I don't just want the small house. I want the entire mountain. Look, look at the goal, right? He's like, everyone else gets like a little piece. And he's like, I want the entire thing, front to back, which the Lord spoke in that day. For you heard in that day how the Anakim were there, that's the giants, and that cities were great and fortified. It's talking about Jericho, right? That it may, it may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. In other words, he said, back when Moses was in charge and he sent Joshua and Caleb and the other guys in there, Joshua and Caleb both said, we can kill all the giants and take Jericho. So he says, just like how I said I could do it back then, I am like that now. There's no one there. Remember, they're all dead now. But he says, I believe that he could do it then. It's been a long time, but I believe that he can do it now. Time has no bearing on me. Just because God said it 40 years ago, doesn't mean it's not gonna happen. That's what he's saying here. He's saying, I can still do it. I believe it, even though I didn't do it. I not only can do it, but I have the full capability and I have the right to take the entire mountain for myself because I wholly believed it and only you and I did it, but you have your own land, basically. Joshua's got his own place 
So he says, this is now all mine because only two of us wholly believe we could take all of Jericho. Look at the next line. And Joshua blessed him and gave, he, and gave Hebron to Caleb. He gave him the entire city, the entire mountain. That is, that is the best war medal I've ever seen. That is the best gift ever. That's like the president giving you all of Randburg and also the Drakensberg. <laughs> you want all, everything and then you get, the, you get the cabin on the roof too. You have the entire city as your inheritance. Next one says, Hebron therefore became the inheritance. Hebron is a very famous city, right? It's always the children of Caleb that's in there. Therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of uh, Japanese, uh, the Kuznite to this day, because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. If you follow the Lord God, your Israel, uh, Lord God, if you wholly follow him, you will inherit the promise. There's two, there's, there's two sides to this, right? Number one, Caleb did the right thing. He wholly followed and his inheritance is an entire city. The other side is, Jesus says to the people with 10 talents, he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. He blesses them. Have dominion over 10 cities. God will give you a city if you pass level, ten, level five. And you may not just have one city. You may have five, you may have two, you may have 10. You may have 11 because somebody else didn't do their job. You can get a city. <laughs> this is why it says, blessed are, the, uh, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the inheritance of God, the inheritance of, king, of the kingdom of God. It's a physical place, a physical land. Just wholly following God. He didn't even fight the giants. That He just believed that he could fight the giants. He believed it and his body stayed in that state for 45 years. That's incredible. And he doesn't have to fight it. What's happening here? He is a more than conqueror. Somebody else has done the victory. Joshua, Jesus is the victor. He has fought the battle. Are we, are we seeing this now, right? Jesus has fought the battle. We are receiving the victory. Amen. Jesus has fought our battles for us. Whatever battle you're fighting, Jesus has already won the battle. All the giants are gone. God only asks you to believe that it's possible. Look at the last one. It says, and the name of Aram was formerly Kirath Abath. Abath was the greatest man among the Anakim. In other words, Joshua got the biggest, big, giant house that was the king's house. Everyone else got regular sized houses. Some of them got giant houses. But Joshua didn't just get a mountain. He got a house, a real sized house from the richest, most powerful giant. The doors must be huge. The living room must be massive. That must be an amazing couch. Then it says, the land had rested from war. In other words, Caleb never fought that battle and never had to. Jesus is the victor. The, victor, the victory is done. We just need to claim it. If, jo if Caleb didn't claim it, it would have gone to somebody else because he wasn't going to give it. Joshua is so old, he's like, ah, for all these guys, he's like tired and battle weary, you know? He's like so done with this whole thing. He's like, let me just sit around and like sleep now or something. But Caleb is like, hey, wait, man. God promised me this land. I am claiming by faith my land for wholly following the word of God. Joshua, Jesus has fought the battle. The battle is done. I'm claiming victory. This is what we need to be. This is, what, this is who we need to be. Caleb was like the brother of Joshua. We are the brothers, of, brothers and sisters of Jesus. He is the firstborn from the dead. He's the one that gets the inheritance 
and Jesus gives us all the inheritance after he fought the battle. He fought that battle in hell a long time ago. He went and cut down all the demons, made an open show of all of Satan in front of hell. And then he's like, I've given you the keys to life and death here on the earth. All you need to do is believe on God, wholly follow his word and claim it. Amen. Amen, let's stand. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Yes, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father God. Amen. So we're gonna pray this morning, amen. Who's ready to pray this morning? Amen. We're gonna pray together, and um, we're gonna do the, law, um, the salvation prayer. And um, I want us to do something very special, and that is we're gonna declare as we're doing the salvation prayer this morning that we're gonna serve the Lord with all our heart, with all our mind, right, with all our strength. And also with willingness and with passion. God loves it when we serve Him with passion, with hunger, with willingness. It actually says that there's rewards and blessings when you serve God in this manner. Amen. And we're going to be the next Caleb. We're going to beat that Joshua. Amen. Am I speaking to Caleb and Joshua this morning? Amen. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You can repeat after me. That includes those of you guys who are joining us online. Lord God, Lord God, I receive, I receive Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, your Son, your Son, as my Lord and Savior, as my Lord and Savior, of my life, of my life, and of my family, of my family. I believe He died for me. I believe He died for me. He took all my sins. He took all my sins. All my mistakes. All my mistakes. And all my problems. And all my problems. To the cross, He nailed it to the cross. He, it. he was dead and buried. And he rose back to life. He rose back to life. Three days later. I thank you that Jesus fought the battle for me. And therefore, as a child of God, I am more than a conqueror. God, I receive the full inheritance that you have for me. Lord, I choose to serve you. Sir. All the days of my life, days of my with, life. Passion, with passion, with hunger, with hunger. As, you said, as you said, with all my heart, with all my, heart, with all my, might, with all my might, and with all my mind, I will serve you and I will love you and bring glory to your name. God, right now, I ask that you fill me with your spirit. Continue to use me. I thank you, Lord that I have a great destiny and a great purpose. I thank you that you're with me even till the end of the age. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit guides me, leads me all the days of my life. I thank you what you started, Lord. You will complete and I will wholly follow you. Thank you, Jesus. My name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I will be amongst those who will live with you in heaven forever and ever. Amen and amen. 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 How are you guys excited this morning? So... We're going to close the service in just a bit. And you know, it's just so, so um, amazing. Amen. And you know, next week, this month of March is such a blessed month. Because you've got Passover. We've got Easter happening here. We've got holidays. But we also got some amazing things that are happening here. And next week, Sunday, um, is next year. Next Next after week Sunday is going to be St. Patrick's Day, oh, yeah. right? And uh, I want to encourage you guys, you can go ahead and as Pastor Ben said, research and find out more about it. This him. video is from a guy, is from Drive Through History. Yes, so yeah. as a family, we watch Drive Through History and they shared his amazing testimony. And it's absolutely amazing. It's about faith, faith, faith. And you get to see the amazing miracles there. And, you know, he's Saint, just like yeah, us, right? St. Patrick. Um, but like like most of you don't know it's it's not saint patrick's day is not about leprechauns and uh you know four-leaf clovers and all that junk right 
St. Patrick was a pastor, but a very special pastor. Uh, St. Patrick avoided death multiple times. He was, uh, he fought several different types of occult um, priests and things like that. He was kidnapped at a young age. He went to Bible school as a child, but was a wild child, didn't really pay attention. Uh, he got saved after being kidnapped as a slave and uh, on the island of, of uh, Ireland. And uh, he used the shamrock or the three leaf clover, which is a real clover, not the four leaf one. He used the three leaf clover to show Father, Son and Holy Spirit to the people that didn't know. Because they said, how can they, can be, how can they be Father, Son and Holy Spirit, but one God? And so he showed them a shamrock and said, it is one flower or one leaf, but three different leaves on the clover. And they were like, oh, okay. So they called it the God of the three faces. But um, one of the most amazing things that most people don't know is, is St. Patrick, the, to fight um, one of the, 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 the pagan occult guys, the priests, they would do something called the burning man. The burning man was a giant man like this, made out of straw, and they would place a human sacrifice inside it and set the whole thing on fire. And they would, that was their gift to their Viking God. And, uh, one, and you know, St. Patrick obviously was talking about Christianity and, you know, like, and he got the chief's son saved, but the pagan God uh, priest guy said, the son should have been sacrificed because he's weak. Because he's crippled, the gods will not like it if he survives. You have to kill the weak, only the strong survive. Right? This is like, like, like evolution or something. And then so the, the mother, the wife of the, of the chief, she said, there's no way I'm killing my son, my only child. And uh, because, because he's crippled. And then he gets healed by St. Patrick. He can walk, he can talk and everything is fine. But the people begin to suffer because the demons are upset. So this guy catches St. Patrick and he says in front of everybody, we're gonna burn you uh, inside the burning man and then prosperity will come back to the Vikings because the God will be happy. And then St. Patrick says, no, 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 listen, my God just healed this boy, right? So here's the, here's the deal. He said, I will go into the fire myself. You light it on fire. I will come out. And if I come out without the smell of smoke, you go in and then we'll light you on fire and see what happens. So that's what happens. He goes inside the giant pyre, they light it on fire, the whole thing burns to a crisp, huge bonfire comes out and he walks out without, the smell, without his clothing being singed. And when the chief and the entire village sees not even the smell of smoke on him, the chief looks at the guy and he says, now your turn. <laughs> and they drag him in there and they burn him and that's how the entire island of Ireland one by one gets saved. And that's not the only time they try to kill him. They try to kill him all because that spirit, of that, that Viking spirit uh, is, is a spirit that likes to kill people. They had like murder mounds and, and like really weird, like, you know, all of the, you know, they have that, 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 that stones with the carving stuff like that. A lot of that was for human sacrifices. And so they had the mound of the hostages and they had this section, that section. They had all these, uh, they have a name for that stack of stones, uh, like, um, uh, yeah, it's like, uh, I'm trying to remember. but basically it was when they dedicated something to their God, they would kill somebody and then like make a, a stack of stones over there as like an, as like an altar. And uh, St. Patrick went one by one and got every uh, person saved. Eventually the entire island was saved, the whole island. And uh, the very last king tried to kill St. Patrick because St. Patrick said Christ is stronger than that king because on um, Easter. Pente Easter, on Pentecost, he was part of the Catholic Church, right? They would always light a giant fire before service. And there was a problem because there was a tradition that said only the king of the region can light the fire. Once he lights the fire, everyone else lights the fire. If somebody else lights the fire, it is an act of war. But St. Patrick said, God is the only king, right? And then the people were like, no, no, Patrick, because if you do this, his army will come and kill us all. And they're all in church. And he's like, no one can hurt us. And he lights it on fire. And then the king on the other side sees the fire because it's on top of the hill. And he gets the entire army 
to come and kill everybody in church, starting with Patrick. Because he said, how can you, because he believes Patrick is calling himself the new king. So he goes there to kill them. And as the entire army charges, this, they, they, they wrote this down. They said, as the army charges with all their spears, their swords, all the Vikings, you know, all their, ah, their crazy stuff. As they are running up the hill, everybody's hiding in the church, but St. Patrick goes out and the, the writings say, without fear. And he looks at the army and he says, may the Lord scatter his enemies and may those who hate him flee from his face, which is a psalm. And when he said this, every single one in the army, a blinding light hit them and they all fell down in the dirt, in the mud, and they couldn't see, they were all blinded. And he was waves, and he kept on saying and that And he waved, verse. and every wave that came, he said the verse again, they all fell down, a light flashed, and they all fell down, and they were all like screaming because they can't see now. And then afterward, like the king saw this, that he was utterly destroyed by a man who spoke, that he said, he came to Patrick and he said, your God is the real God, and only your religion will be all over Ireland. If anyone opposes your God, we will kill them. And when that happened, everybody that was blinded could see again. All the army. So the entire island was saved. In like, well, that second half of the island was saved in a single day. St. Patrick, in fact, if you go through his story, you find all five levels of what I preached about. You, you can see how he, he, he multiplied the people, how he, he went through psychological warfare, all the things. That final pyre fi fight was the last fight he ever did because the entire island got saved. It was crazy. St. Patrick also has an area where he baptized people, but he would kneel into a little pool because the pool was kind of shallow and he would baptize them. And you can, if you go there today, the imprint of his knees are in the stone because he baptized so many people, his legs like dug the stone out. So you can see his legs and his knees from when he, because he baptized all the whole island. Uh, because every time he baptized him, some of the water went through his knees and it created that imprint over there. It's quite amazing. Uh, and the restaurant that he went to eat at is still running today. That after church, everyone would go and eat at the same restaurant. It's still running. You can still go there and eat and potatoes. And you know, they love like potatoes, yeah? potatoes and mash and like wedges and chips and uh, whole potatoes, baked potatoes, baby potatoes, a lot of potatoes. <laughs> it's like, it's amazing. But anyway, he was a great man of God. And what Satan did was Satan took it and perverted it and made it something weird. The same way Satan took Christmas and made it something weird. The same way they took Halloween. Halloween was a day to remember the death of the martyrs. All Hallows Eve, the night to remember the hallowed ones. That's what it meant. And they began to like, no, it's a harvest thing and the, the, the demons and they're like, ah, crazy stuff. So they perverted that. In fact, uh, Valentine's Day, you know, we, we spoke about that one. It's also based on the martyrs, uh, a Christian story that was also changed to be about love and all that stuff. But anyway, you, you can, yeah, you, we, yeah. We, we, maybe we can put the video on, on the workers group and then everyone can find it. Yeah, so how many of you guys you, learned something new that you didn't know about St. Patrick today? Yeah. Amen. So that's one of the reasons we wanted to celebrate because it's a story of faith. And it's, it, you know, it's amazing hearing his story. It builds faith into us because I know he's just a person just like you and me. And if he could do it, so can we do it. And it's because Jesus, Jesus said, greater works you will do in my name. Amen. Do you guys receive that this morning? Amen. Amen. So we're going to close in prayer now. <laughs> and to those of you guys who prayed with us and you recommitted your life to Jesus, please contact our ministry or come to the front of be in the auditorium. We want to pray for you and give you guys some free stuff. Amen. But let's pray together. Lord God, we come before in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord God, we thank you, Lord. God, that you taught us, Lord, all the way from pre uh, pre-level one lord god about the three anointings lord all the way god into level uh, five god lord i thank you lord wherever each and every one of us are in those levels god i thank you what you started lord you will accomplish god you will finish and lord i also thank you lord god the lord when 
as we've learned lord when we make mistakes god you made provision for it and god i thank you right now lord as we go from glory to glory and grace to grace god lord i thank you as you prayed earlier we will do it lord with wholehearted devotion god lord god with lord god we will follow your commandments god even down to the littlest thing god i pray right now lord reawaken god and lord god refresh us god i thank you lord god for fresh fire for fresh passion god and it into each and every one of us Lord even old prophecies God that Lord we forgotten Lord God I pray right now reawaken it Lord God refresh us God Lord God revive us Lord and remind us of what you promised and God and the same way Lord we remind you Lord of all the promises you've made to us God because Lord you are faithful God to keep to your word God like Caleb we claim our inheritance we claim the healing we claim the breakthrough we claim the deliverance we claim every thing God that you've died to give us Lord that you've given to us so that we can become more than conquerors and God I also thank you as you were with Joshua Lord your Holy Spirit has been given to us God we have even greater we have your Holy Spirit God I thank you for continuing to lead us to grow us Lord God I thank you you are Lord over this church God as we go home today Lord God and as the month progresses God we thank you Lord God for more glorious uh, impartations God for more encounters Lord of more angelic Lord God visitations Lord as even we're learning about the angelic on Wednesdays God we thank you Lord let your will be done Lord let your kingdom come in our lives in our homes and in our families cover us all right now with your blood take us safely to wherever we need to go both those on campus and online i thank you your angels god protect us and god we take authority over every demonic spirit god and we bind it and send back into the pit of hell god every spirit lord god out of accidents breakdown hijacking crime violence reckless driving god we bind those spirits and we send them back into the pit of hell i thank you god as your word says we trample lord god over the demonic lord because everything bows to your name and we give you all the praise the glory and the honor in jesus mighty name amen and amen we'll see you on wednesday night at 7 p.m as we continue teaching on angels amen